Native Americans in the northern wilds believed that a vengeful spirit inhabited the untamed wilderness, preying on man and beast alike, a spirit born of desperation and unspeakable sin that warped the bodies and minds of those who would succumb and drive them to feast on their kin in whatever living things they could find. They called it a Wendigo. I couldn't have been older than ten when my father took us hunting. My father, my older brother Bradley and me, hiking through the Yukon like actual pioneers or fur traders. Bradley taught me a lot about tracking as we hiked, pointing out tracks in the mud and snow, broken branches, disturbances in the brush. Dad taught him, and he was teaching me. Dad always said it was because of the native blood in his veins that he preferred hunting off the trail and reserves. Looking back, I think it might be because he just didn't feel like paying for permits. We'd made it to the lodge we were staying in just before dusk. Any later would have probably been a death sentence for us, but I was too young to realize at the time. As we sat around the fireplace, eating our MREs Dad always kept in stock, I couldn't get something from the trip out of my head that I'd seen on our way up the mountain. It almost looked like a man, but something was just off. It was misshapen, twisted, unnaturally skinny, and had to be at least eight feet tall. It let out some kind of shrill, inhuman shriek before I watched Macrob, nude form, bound off into the trees. Of course, I was the only one that saw it. Bradley and Dad both heard the call, but our dad said it was just an elk. I know what elks sound like, and that definitely wasn't it. This was something predatory, something guttural. My life wasn't the same after that trip. When we got home, I was absolutely consumed with what I'd seen. I even took to calling them Wendy's affectionately. Every piece of media related to the legend, every historical documentation, every book, movie, there's very little I didn't study extensively. When I got a little older, I even joined a message board for cryptid sightings, but results were a lot less than what I'd hoped to find. Crackpots and lunatics raving about Bigfoot and Chupacabra and bog beasts. Anyone who claimed to see a Wendigo was completely off their gourd, or their notes didn't line up. I knew I wasn't crazy. I knew what I saw. Eventually I even moved to the Yukon after I graduated, taking up residence in a cabin and working as a dispatcher for a bobcat rental service. I knew that I could be the one to find a real Wendigo and reveal it to the world. That was 30 years ago. The bobcats are gone, but I'm still here. Just me, on the mountain range in my cabin. At least I can say I became quite the hunter, or else I'd have died years ago. Elk and rabbit have sort of a gamey taste, but when it's all that's around you, you get used to it fast. I occasionally run into people in a trading stand, located a couple hours east, but that's usually the extent of my interactions with other people face to face, if hunters don't frequent the lodges that year. I couldn't tell you if Bradley's alive or dead. I'm pretty sure my dad must have died by now. Maybe that's why things went the way they did. But it had to happen. I had to be right. Had to be. What comes next, I need you to not judge me for. To someone removed from the situation, what follows is going to sound cruel. 
if not particularly gruesome. I'll admit it's never something I would have imagined myself doing when I was younger. Then again, I didn't think I'd do a lot of things. I always wanted to be a zoologist. I guess I still kind of am. Instead of a wife and a house, I had a cabin over an old storm cellar. And a monster I hadn't seen for nearly 40 years. One could say that time sort of ravaged me. Or drove me insane. Maybe it did. Maybe it did, but it doesn't change what happened last spring. There was an early thaw last winter that gave way to a freak blizzard in... What was it? I want to say early May, but I have trouble keeping track of the months sometimes. It's all seasons to me. Anyway, this wasn't the usual snowstorm. I've seen plenty on the range, but this was something else. This was something almost biblical. High winds, whiteout conditions, dangerously low temperatures. I was fine on supplies for months, and set to wait it out in the relative comfort of the cabin. Until I heard the damnedest thing. A chirp on my outside motion sensors. How these people found me I have no idea. Half frozen to death. Near breaking my door down. A man. A woman. Two teenagers. All huddled in the snow. They didn't look well equipped for the white hell that was raining down on them, so I didn't really hesitate to bring them inside. My French isn't that great, but I was able to gather that they were a family from Quebec that was doing some sightseeing and got caught off guard by the storm. They lost their way trying to navigate back to their camper and near died before they saw the lights through my windows. They were mostly grateful to get in somewhere warm, and lucky enough to find someone willing to share some food. Father Renard, Mother Janine, 13-year-old Benoit, and 15-year-old Gwen. They were all nice enough, happy to be alive. It got pretty clear that they were going to have to stay for a spell until the storm died down, and they'd be able to navigate back. But Renard was able to show me on a map where they were trying to get to. Turns out they were a ways off. After the storm broke, I'd be able to lead them the several kilometers down to their campsite. But they'd have to at least stay the night. There wasn't much room in the main cabin. But I had a few army cots sitting around and there was plenty of room in the cellar. So I had R Renard and Benoit help me move a few things up into the storage closet and set them up down there. As I closed the hatch to give my guests some privacy, I got to thinking. In Wendigo Legends, there's always something that causes the creature to come into being. Sometimes it's a curse, or they're born, or it's like a possession thing. But the most common source I've I've seen has always been one particularly gruesome thing. The act of cannibalism. Man-eating man. The most horrific abomination man could think of. Here I was, in a remote cabin, four weary travelers far from home, in a basement with one way in and one way out. Warning you now, this is where things start getting unpleasant and the situation doesn't improve. Suffering wasn't something I'd wanted to cause, but it was going to have to happen. They were going to have to be desperate, desperate enough for the unthinkable. Just before dawn, I threw a bucket down the steps, reclosed the hatch, and locked it down with an old tire chain and a padlock. I could hear them through the floor, confused and startled. Janine made her way up the steps and discovered the hatch wouldn't move. From what I was able to hear, there was the sound of confusion giving way to anxiety. Renard came to the top and gave the hatch quite a shove, only to discover the chain. 
they did their best to yell and speak to me, and I just kept acting like I couldn't understand them. After all, I don't really speak much French. They must have thought I was crazy at first. I need to make it known that I don't take pleasure in what had to happen. So, but there's not undoing what happened. I tried to make the situation as pleasant as possible, given the circumstances. The bucket was for whatever bathroom needs they had, and I was still feeding them, just not very much. They were on a liquid diet, all water and smoothies I'd make. From what I understood, it took around three weeks with no actual food for starvation to kill a person. Really, I was hoping it wouldn't take that long for one of them to give in and partake. But we had all the time in the world. Eventually, a search party would go looking for them. But we were far enough away from where they would look for them that we wouldn't be disturbed. I thought that the worst part was going to be the screaming. But that mostly stopped by the third day. No, the worst part I felt was the waiting. It was supposed to take three weeks, but I honestly lost track of the days and couldn't tell you how long they were down there. I don't know if I'd forgotten a stash of food down there or if they were rationing, but they were holding on, waiting on anything for weeks on end. But waiting for people to die and eat each other, that's a whole other animal. One morning, I accidentally found a way to expedite the process a bit. I popped the hatch up a bit to roll their fluids down, and Benoit's arm grabbed my pant leg and damn near gave me a heart attack. I'm not exactly sure what he was planning, but he was holding on as tight as his malnourished arm could hold. With my other foot, I stomped down on the hatch a good two or three times, breaking the boy's arm. He finally pulled it back in, and I could hear him screaming in agony after falling back down the stairs. The sound of his arm breaking under my foot was absolutely stomach-turning, and I had to turn up some music just to drown out his screams. His parents pled with me for medical attention, but there wasn't anything I could do. If they got out, the experiment would be ruined. It wasn't long at all before Benoit's injury became infected. He was a tough kid and held on for as long as he could, but nature took its course. While I heard Janine wailing one night, I knew he was gone. I figured he would be the main course, so to speak, and resolved to cut off their rations until they finally ate him. But then the smell kicked in a couple of days after he passed, and it was absolutely putrid coming through the floorboards and I had to dispose of him. I just couldn't handle the smell. I made my way down the steps with my hunting rifle and ordered the family to the wall. They were definitely thinning, but they were holding on. When I realized I wasn't going to be able to drag the boy's body up the stairs by myself, I had to enlist Renard's help. One thing I'll say is that I absolutely respect Renard. That could not have been an easy thing to do but he did it for his family. We managed to get the body up the stairs and out the door when he decided to try something stupid. Renard threw a punch that caught me across the jaw, but the force sent him stumbling over. I assume it was the last of his energy going to that punch because when he struggled to his feet to swing at me again, I smashed him in the head with the butt of my rifle. It must have been too hard of a strike because he immediately went down and started convulsing. With his feet twitching and feebly kicking around in the snow, I'd messed this man up beyond what I could repair at this point, and did the only merciful thing, shooting him in the head. As I stood in front of the cabin, shrouded by melting snow and two dead captives, another idea crossed my mind. When my dad took my brother and me hunting, he insisted that we did our part in every step of the kill, from tracking and stalking to the actual killing, all the way to field dressing and processing. 
I discovered really quickly that processing a human being isn't that much different from a deer, or any other big game, less fur, different proportions, but the process and a lot of the cuts are the same. I was hesitant about taking anything from Benoit since his infection had obviously killed him and I didn't know how it would affect the meat. Couldn't exactly risk the girls getting sick and dying. Fortunately, Renard still had some usable meat in him, despite being emaciated. I was able to get a few good decent slices out of him, and then I got to work in the kitchen. Another day and a half passed before I peered down the hatch and laid out two bowls of stew. Gwen was clearly starving, and nearly ate it before Janine smacked it from her hand, knowing immediately something was wrong. She demanded to know where her husband was. But of course, that was between me and him. After that, there was no more water or smoothies. Just day after day, Stu sat on the top of the step. Four days passed before hunger finally took over and Janine stopped resisting Gwen's desire to put anything in her stomach. I don't know if Gwen just didn't know she was eating her father, or if she just didn't care at that point. Initially, I was disappointed to see that all Gwen had seemed to develop was a stomach bug, vomiting violently into their bucket. I was starting to lose hope. Had I wasted my life chasing a ghost story? Had I abducted and terrorized a family for nothing? These thoughts tortured me the entire day, until I started hearing what sounded like Gwen having a seizure in the cellar. The thumping and flopping gave way to some strange animalistic growling, with Janine weakly trying to comfort her daughter. The next morning it happened. I finally heard it. The sound I'd waited my whole life to hear again. The shriek of a Wendigo. I opened up the hatch to investigate to see Gwen, or what used to be Gwen, hunched over her mother's corpse, tearing pieces of the abdomen out and mindlessly eating them. Her body was warped, near skeletal, as she used her newly developed claws to tear chunks of flesh from Janine. Her head snapped in my direction with an unnatural quickness, completely warped with blood and sick covering a mouth of jagged fangs with flesh stuck between the teeth and eyes that had gone from a dark green to a corpse-like pale blue. She lunged across the cellar at me, but I was able to dive back up the hatch and relock the padlock before she reached the top of the stairs. The chain was holding, but barely as it fairly slammed against the trap door. Now I was faced with a conundrum that I hadn't thought of before. The Wendigo was real. I'd made it. But how was I going to get it out of my house? I didn't stand a chance of fighting it off if I opened the hatch, and the chain wasn't going to hold forever, so time was a factor. I had to rely on its predatory instincts and pray it would go for an easy meal. Benoit was still in the shed, I remembered. He was putrid and beginning to bloat, but I doubted it was going to care at that point. I dragged the corpse into my living room, and it certainly sensed that there was food, as the slamming against the trapdoor got even more desperate. I positioned Benoit towards the kitchen nook, and then took a position behind the trapdoor where I unlocked the chain and took a step back as quietly as I could. It climbed out of the latch, crawling around the room on all fours, sniffing aggressively, eventually making its way to its brother's body. From what I could tell, it didn't be, seem to be able to see that well. What used to be Gwen was aware of me, but seemed content with the easy meal for the time being. While the four-wheeler in the shed wasn't the ideal getaway vehicle. It worked out fine as I sped down the hill. As I drove down the trail, I was able to hear the distant call of a Wendigo echo through the trees. 
I stayed at the empty shack that housed the Bobcat rentals for two days while I waited to make sure the Wendigo had left. And when I went home, it was gone. Only a bloody mess, and what was most of a teenage boy's skeleton, and a blood trail leading to the trees. I'm not crazy. Wendigos are real. And I saw two of them in my life with my own eyes. I still hear it scream in the woods. And sometimes, I even catch a glimpse of it. I haven't gotten a picture yet, but I'm hopeful. Every now and then, I'll find his handiwork elk and other animals ripped to shreds. I don't expect her to move on anytime soon, but with hunting season starting soon on the mountain again, it'll have prey aplenty and I'll be able to study it up close. It also seems drawn to my house and likes to stay close by. Maybe it senses I'm food or maybe it's drawn back from some vague memories of where it was born. Every so often, I see it on the monitor when it comes close enough to set off a perimeter sensor. And every time I hear its guttural screech echo through the trees, I can't help but chuckle. Everyone knows it's Wendy. Recently, a few months ago, I moved into a new house in the mountains. It's almost always cold, and I'm surrounded by woods, but... Like I said, it's easier to do my job in isolation, with little distractions. I sell paintings, and am paid a small monthly check to write poems for a magazine that is both online and physical. The new surroundings have given me all sorts of inspiration, both for writing and painting. The strange occurrences started about a week into me living here. More and more frequently, I'd find dead animals nearby. Not really gored or anything, just dead. Rabbits, birds, and the occasional fox. It freaked me out, but I just assumed it was a predator of sorts, showing off because they felt threatened by me. I decided to always carry around a gun and a taser, just to be safe. I also decided to call an expert of the mountains and asked him to visit. When he came, he seemed worried. Now this man was a fairly old Native American who had lived on these mountains for about his whole life, so this concerned me. Knowing he knew just about everything on this mountain, he sat me down and told me a tale of a dark creature, born of hunger and cold, a Wendigo. I was skeptical. This was a creature of fiction, at least. I thought it was. He left with a stern warning to never stray too far from home without good reason, and never follow the voices of the forest as it may be a Wendigo, luring me to their feeding grounds. I spent the next few days watching the woods closely. Maybe if I got a glimpse of whatever was in the woods, my mind could be put at ease. At first I saw nothing. Then I saw swift movement among the underbrush and trees. It wasn't until around the fifth day of watching, I saw something clearly. Something standing upright with deer-like legs, staring at me with pale eyes. I quickly went inside, suddenly feeling chilled to the bone. It took a bit and some self-pumping before I could go back outside to do my painting and wood-watching. I found myself putting what I could see of the creature in my paintings, but I could never catch the coldness of its eyes quite right. It fascinated and terrified me greatly, but I couldn't stop. The creature got braver, showing a bit more as time passed. I could now confirm it had a large set of antlers, and its front limbs were not hooves like the back legs, but claws. 
It watched me almost as curiously as I watched it. I knew then that it was likely a Wendigo, one that decided to watch me, although I didn't dare attempt to approach it. Knowing its curious nature might be as deceiving as a wolf's smile. Although I never really verbally called its name, I subconsciously named it Branch. It seemed suiting. He started, or I think it was him, pushing over items on my porch, like empty paint pots and small decorations, going back to the tree line by the time I came outside. It didn't really bother me, as nothing got damaged. Kind of reminded me of a cat, actually. I began speaking to it, not expecting responses. While I painted, I would just ramble out loud, knowing he was just at the trees. I don't know if he listened, but I think he did, as his ears would face towards me the whole time, those long, slightly disproportionate ears. One day, he appeared with scars a few still bleeding. This concerned me, but I couldn't get close to him. He was an injured animal and would even more likely attack me if I got close. After a few days, they healed to pale marks on his skin. This happened a few times, but I learned to ignore it. This routine went on for a good while. I watched him. He watched me but we kept our distance. But that changed yesterday. He approached me, and I didn't even notice till I saw his shadow. I looked up and saw a shaggy black fur that smelled like rotting meat. I could see his cold, empty eyes so clearly now. They were genuinely curious, but hungry. I didn't move. I froze up. I didn't even shiver. After what seemed like an eternity, he turned and headed towards the trees. I didn't dare move until he disappeared among the trees. I went inside and called the man that warned me of them. He agreed to come pick me up when we could. I'm waiting for the man to get here. Branch is staring at me through the window. Excuse me for the wait, I couldn't find much time to write after I posted. A few hours after the man pulled in the front, which, unlucky for me, was where Branch was. I got the meat chop I had pulled out earlier and stepped outside. Branch was staring through the window. When he turned to look at me, I made sure to look at his chest fur rather than his eyes soulless, cold eyes. I threw the meat. He ignored it, didn't even twitch. I started to slowly move towards the man's truck, Branch's eyes tracking me. As I moved off the porch, he started to follow me, his hooves making heavy footfall on the wood. His eyes never left me as I slowly made my way to the car. He slowly followed, staying three feet away, no more, no less. When I finally made it in, he was still staring, with those cold, empty eyes. The man slowly pulled out and started down the long mountain trail. He started muttering about how I shouldn't have let it get this far as well as the other colorful words and terms. Right now I'm at his cottage, at the base of the mountain. I'm still shaken, and I don't know if I want to risk going back. His wife is lovely and treats me well, as far as guests go, but I know I'll have to leave soon. The man explained that the Wendigo was one well known on the mountain, known for only attacking young females, always leaving the head intact. Now, this is only semi-relevant, as I am a man, but he can't explain 
why he's taken a sudden interest in me. Maybe he's contemplating eating me. In a few hours, he's taken me back. He's given me food, a gun, several rounds, and a blowtorch. I got home an hour ago. Branch wasn't there, but my porch looked like a tornado passed. And I think there's stuff by the doorstep. I quickly went inside and locked the doors and windows. I don't think he knows I'm back yet, and frankly, I don't want him to know. It's been a few hours and no sign of him. I don't want to go outside to tidy up my porch, I'm too scared to. It's hard to swallow the sandwich I made because of the tension I'm feeling, but I have to eat. I think I'm going to take a nap after I finish it. He's here. He's staring into the windows and making distorted huffs and brays, occasionally stamping his hooves on the porch. He can't see me right now because I'm behind the couch. He sounds angry. He started banging his antlers on the glass. He's trying to break it. It's starting to crack. The glass shattered. My heart is pounding. My ears are ringing. I can smell the rotted meat he reeks of. He crawled in through the window. I, I think he can smell me. He started knocking over random things, but I'm frozen. I can't bring myself to peek. I might try to make a run for it. Or I'll have to wait it out. He just went down the hall. I'm going to go out the front door and run. I don't know how far I ran, but the sun went down by the time I stopped, and the temperature is definitely below freezing. Luckily, I was already wearing a heavy coat, and I found a small overhang. I will rest. Hopefully he doesn't find me. I woke up, but it's still dark out. It's only 12. I slept three hours. I'm shivering like crazy, but the overhang helps a little bit, blocking the wind. The forest seems still. Nothing is stirring. Not even the owls are hooting. I'm going to go back to sleep. Hopefully it's light out when I wake up this time. I woke up an hour or so ago and started walking toward the base of the mountain. My limbs feel numb, but the movement has helped. The forest is eerily quiet, and I keep finding blood puddles and tufts of fur. I think Branch threw a massive tantrum. I need to find a house with people in it. Safety in numbers. I didn't bring the gun, I know I'm stupid. But I just wanted away from him. I started running again. I hear what sounded like hooves and I swear I smelled rotting flesh again. If he catches me on his turf, I'm honestly fair game to kill. Even if I'm not his preferred food. I found a field of corpses. Deer, bears, rabbits, wolves, birds, dead animals everywhere. I quickly went around it, holding my breath, trying not to puke. I guess that's why the forest was so quiet. He killed all the animals in a fit, like a violent child throwing a tantrum. A child that could easily rip out my throat and cave in my ribcage and skull. I'm seriously hoping he isn't following me. I can see houses. I think I found one of those retreats for monks or whatever who take vows of silence. I'm going to see if they can help me. So good news. They happily let me into a living area where I could warm up and provided food and a warm drink. I think it's just milk. They contacted someone and wrote me a note, saying that someone would be coming for me to take me off the mountain. A few decided to be curious, so I explained what happened. A few wrote me off, but others gave me scared, shocked looks. They've taken me to bedroom and communicated that I can sleep until the person coming to get me actually gets here. When he does, I'm not going back. My things can stay there, as can Branch. I'll find somewhere else to live. 
like an apartment in a city with people. I was able to sleep a few hours before the guy came. I told him, just take me to the nearest town. I'm outside a motel right now, slowly making calls and arrangements. I'm never going back to that place with that thing, ever. Hey everyone, Dismal Hero here, and I'd like to thank you for checking out the video. Please subscribe if you haven't already, like and share the video if you enjoyed it. I'm always looking for new and exciting stories, so if you have a scary encounter that has happened to you, please email it to me in the link in my description. Thank you for watching, and I look forward to seeing you back here again next time.